Hello everyone, Josh from What Culture here, and between you and me, Martin Scorsese's Shutter Island is pretty good, isn't it? The movie absolutely rules, and even better, it is a textbook example of a movie that just gets better and better every single time you watch it, because there are so many references and easter eggs and foreshadowing packed into it that you can never get every little detail on just one watch. You need to see it at least twice, and more likely ten times to get everything. So with that in mind, I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com, and these are 20 things you somehow missed in Shutter Island. Number 20, Chuck's inexperience with weapons. There's an incredible tell early on in the movie that Teddy Daniels' new partner, Chuck, isn't actually the US Marshal that he's presented to us as. And that's because when the pair first arrive at Ashcliff Hospital, the two are asked to surrender their weapons. And at this point, Chuck starts awkwardly fumbling with both his gun and his gun holster, to the point where he just takes the whole contraption off and hands McPherson the gun while it's still in its slot. Now the thing about this is, yes, it is a gag, but it also has a deeper meaning, because no veteran cop would fumble so much with such a standard issue weapon, and the fact that this guy does clearly indicates that he's not actually a cop at all, because, well, it turns out he's actually Teddy's doctor, Lester Sheehan, which explains why he just can't get the gun out. Number 19, The Edgy Guards. The disposition of Shudder Island's guards throughout the movie as well also tips us off that something isn't quite right. See, when Teddy gets into the vehicle with McPherson, he notices that the guards are all staring at him quite intently. He actually mentions how on edge all of the guards seem to be, to which he gets the reply, Right now, Marshal, we all are. Now, on an initial viewing, it's easy to just assume that what is being referred to here is the fact that the guards are incredibly anxious because, after all, there is, at this moment in time, supposed to be a missing patient. But, with everything we know about the film in hindsight, it's clear that the guards are actually more anxious about being involved in this elaborate roleplay that's supposed to cure Teddy. Number 18, Shutter Island is an anagram of truth and lies. Because very little in this movie happens by accident, even its title is a tricky little bit of sleight of hand. And that's because the name Shutter Island is actually an anagram of both the phrases truth and lies and truth denials. Which is fitting given the story's focus on elusiveness of truth and denial slash self-deception. Of course, the anagram gimmick is present in the film itself as well, and explicitly stated by Ben Kingsley's character. At one point, he directly tells the audience that Andrew Ladis is an anagram of Edward Daniels, and Rachel Salando is an anagram of Teddy's dead wife, Dolores Chanel. Number 17, Teddy doesn't strike matches in the movie's first half. Keep an eye on Teddy's smoking habits in the first half of the movie, and you might notice something particularly interesting. See, in the first half of the movie, Teddy never actually strikes a match himself to light his cigarette, and it's always Chuck or someone else doing the honours. Now, on the one hand, you could argue that this is simply a safety precaution to not give a mentally ill person on the island a pack of matches. However, the detail more likely relates to Teddy's traumatic association with fire after his wife was allegedly killed in a fire set by Andrew Ladis. And this is compelling, because at almost exactly the film's midway point, Teddy's treatment starts to work and he starts becoming more like Andrew again. Thus, at this point, he begins skulking around Shutter Island while lighting his own cigarettes with matches, because this character trait of Teddy's is slowly slipping away. Number 16, there's way more CGI than you think. Though it might seem like a bunch of Shutter Island was shot on location or inside elaborate sets, Martin Scorsese actually spent a huge chunk of his $80 million budget on VFX. For one, green screen compositing was used to create the vast exteriors of the island itself, combining CGI with practical elements and miniatures. But most impressively, even the interior sets of Ward C needed a whole bunch of CGI work to be convincing. And that's because, due to the logistical and technical complexity of building and lighting such huge sets, Scorsese instead filmed most of these scenes on partial sets, employing a whole ton of green screen in the process. Number 15, The Patient Flirting with Chuck. Early in the movie, Teddy and Chuck speak with a patient called Bridget Kearns, who killed her husband with an axe. 
And when Teddy asks her about Dr. Sheehan, she becomes visibly nervous before saying that he's nice and easy on the eyes, to which Scorsese then cuts directly to Chuck, who awkwardly looks away before sheepishly letting out a sly smile. Now, on an initial viewing, it's easy to just pawn this moment off as Chuck having an exasperated laugh because this patient is bringing up a pointless detail when they're trying to find a missing person, but of course, in hindsight, he's laughing because she's talking about him and he's getting a little bashful that she's saying these things right to his face and pretending he's someone else. Number 14, the invisible water cup. And literally seconds after this, the patient asks Chuck to get her a cup of water while she writes something down for Teddy. Chuck then returns and passes her the cup of water, yet as she drinks it, eagle-eyed viewers might notice that her hand is actually empty. The cup is visible in the next shot as she puts it down admittedly, but it is with a different hand to the one that she picked it up with. Some did pie this off as a mere goof, but it seems way more intentional on the part of Martin Scorsese and his longtime editor, Thelma Schoonmaker, rather than a weird mistake that just ended up in the movie. I mean, you'd probably notice if someone didn't actually have a cup, right? It seems intentional. Number 13, the guard behind Teddy. And one final detail on this scene before I move on, I promise. Just keep an eye on how Scorsese frames characters within this scene. In particular, notice that during their individual shots, we always see a guard standing behind Kearns and Teddy, but not Chuck. Now, you probably would expect to see a guard stood in close proximity to a patient. However, the fact that he's also framed right behind Teddy, again, is another hint that Teddy is himself a patient of this institution. And even when we cut to the wide shot of Teddy and Chuck, the guard is still on the right-hand side of the screen by Teddy, and therefore able to quickly restrain Teddy if he does end up violently acting out for whatever reason. Number 12, it has no original music. Instead of opting to use an original score for Shutter Island, Scorsese instead decided to only pick existing music to soundtrack the film. And so Shutter Island's soundtrack consists of nothing more than classical music, which immediately disqualified it from being nominated for the Best Original Score Oscar due to its total reliance on existing tunes. Number 11, Teddy's jacket is too big. Now here's something that basically leaps out the screen to even the most unobservant of us, and I definitely class myself within that group, and that's the fact that Teddy's coat kinda looks too big for him, doesn't it? While on an initial viewing, some could simply dismiss this as a weird costume mistake, it's actually an incredibly straightforward hint that Teddy isn't really who he's presented as. Teddy looks like he's someone playing dress up because, well, that's exactly who he is. Evidently, the Ashcliffe staff couldn't be bothered to size him up and buy him a new jacket, the cheap skates, so instead just use whatever clothing they had lying around for the experiment. Number 10, the true meaning of a rat in a maze. Jackie Earl Haley memorably appears in Shutter Island for one particularly juicy scene, playing the deranged inmate George. He tells Teddy that the doctors are experimenting on their patients and that they're all a part of some kind of elaborate game. He also memorably tells Teddy that he's just a rat in a maze, which at first glance you probably don't take too much notice of because this guy has obviously got his issues and can't be trusted. He's not a reliable narrator is all I'm saying. Or at least that's what we think. And that's because this line actually turns out to be a smoking gun, as Teddy is a test subject in a bold psychological experiment from which escape is either unlikely or downright impossible. Number 9, the guards aren't actually looking for Rachel. Teddy and Chuck, of course, visit Shutter Island at all on the pretense of looking for the mission patient, Rachel Salando. But there is one major clue that this Rachel doesn't actually exist at all, and that's, again, if you look at the guards who are supposedly searching for her. And when I say they're searching, I'm being incredibly generous. And that's because the guards are largely seen to be less than enthusiastic about actually finding Rachel, with Scorsese showing them sitting down, laughing, and otherwise not really giving a damn about an escaped patient. Now this works in the moment, because Scorsese leads us to believe that he's just showing these guards as being unsympathetic and callous to the fact that a patient has gone missing on the island, when in reality he's actually hinting towards the fact that Rachel doesn't exist, 
So why would these guards actually search for her? It's all just to keep up the role player, and let's face it, they can't be bothered. Number eight, the symbolism of the Band-Aid. From the film's very first scene, Teddy wears a distinctive plaster, that's Band-Aid for you Americans, above his left eye, which does actually come into play in the movie. And that's because if you play close attention, you might actually notice that it disappears at one point. At the start of the third act, Dr. John Cawley informs Teddy that he came to the island alone and without a partner, after which Teddy takes a long shower. And from this point on, the Band-Aid is nowhere to be seen as Teddy's delusions start to slip away and he comes to realise why he's actually on the island and who he really is. So the removal of this affectation is both a literal and metaphorical ripping off of the Band-Aid now that Teddy fully understands what the hell is going on. It's not so old, but it's pretty cool. Number seven, the Shining Homage. If you're gonna borrow, you might as well borrow from the best, and that's advice Scorsese absolutely took to heart while making Shutter Island. And that's because if the music used in the opening title sounds a little bit familiar, it's probably because it is, as it's been used in yet another horror movie great. See, the titles are scored to an excerpt from the 1967 orchestral composition Lontano, which was also used throughout Stanley Kubrick's iconic The Shining. Number six, the reverse cigarette smoke. Teddy's nightmare sequence halfway through the movie sees him smoking a cigarette that's lit by who he believes to be the real Andrew Ladis. He then comes across the bloodstained visage of Rachel Salando. And after Rachel lets out a scream, Teddy turns and if you take a close look at his cigarette, you'll notice that the smoke is actually disappearing back into it in reverse. It's a pretty basic VFX trick all considered, but it's a cool little detail to make you realize that something nightmarish and unnatural is afoot. Number five, the law of four. The mystery of Rachel's disappearance is actually egged on by an apparent note that she left behind. Nobody knows what this means because all it said was the law of four who is 67. In reality, of course, the note is simply part of the role play intended to lead Teddy to break his delusions and embrace his real identity as Andrew, something that's very sneakily hinted at midway through the story. See, when Teddy attends a staff meeting held at Ashcliff, Dr. Corley actually mentions the note itself. At this point, Scott says he cuts to a staff member at the meeting who offhandedly tells a colleague, the law of four, I love that. It's such a quick moment, but once the twist is known, again, it's a cool hint that everyone involved in this movie, apart from Teddy, knows what's going on and is fully in on all of the little details of the plan. Number four, Teddy refuses to look at Ladis' intake form. At the end of the second act, Chuck tells Teddy that he took a detour to the inpatient files room and actually found the file on Andrew Ladis. Now this should be a big find that Teddy wants to know about, but Teddy doesn't want to look at this file at all and will take every excuse to just pie it off on Chuck and not actually confront it. And of course, in retrospect, this is evidently a case of Teddy being unconsciously aware that the form will contain his true identity, and so choosing to avoid looking at it will shatter his present dissociative delusion, so he just avoids it altogether. Number three, Teddy's outstanding defense mechanisms. Early on in the film, Teddy meets with Dr. Carley and his assistant, Dr. Jeremiah Nehring. And after Teddy refuses an alcoholic drink, Nehring notes the incidence of alcoholism in the police force, to which Teddy retorts that psychiatry is a profession quote-unquote overrun with boozers and drunks. Jeremiah then laughs and retorts that Teddy has outstanding defense mechanisms. There's of course a wider meaning to this though, given that the entire point of the movie is that the doctors are attempting to break Teddy out of his delusion, which requires battling his admittedly very substantial psychological defense mechanisms. So yeah, the comment was way more loaded than we figured at the time, because that's literally the entire premise of the movie. Number two, Teddy's dead daughter visibly moves. At the very end of the movie, the truth is revealed to Teddy, and we get a nightmarish vision of the aftermath after Dolores drowned her three children. Teddy removes the kids from the lake and lays their bodies on the shore, yet if you look very closely, you can actually see the actress portraying the daughter breathing and moving her eyes underneath her eyelids. And unlike a lot of the other so-called goofs on this list, this one probably is just a mistake. Hey, acting dead is pretty hard, you know, you can't blame anyone. 
Number one, the sun only comes out at the end. A major component of Shutter Island's incredible atmosphere throughout most of his runtime is down to the chaotic weather that's happening around the island. When Teddy quote unquote arrives on Shutter Island, the sky is dull and overcast, and over the course of the first half of the film, the weather becomes increasingly dire until a full on storm breaks out. And even once the storm passes, the rest of the movie still has a grim palette to it, that is, until Teddy's delusions are finally broken. It's only once Teddy comes to his senses and we fully understand the true nature of the plot that the sun comes out, and yep, it's not a subtle metaphor, but it is still a good one. So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. How many of these details did you notice in Shutter Island? And has this list given you the encouragement you need to go and rewatch this movie? I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Let me know in the comments and while you're down there, if you could, please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to What Culture's channel for more videos like this every single day. Even if you don't though, I've been Josh. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.